Great. Uh, next up is uh, Dr. Rob Edwards. Uh, Dr. Edwards is a licensed clinical psychologist in the Pain Management Center at Brigham Women's Hospi uh, Hospital in Boston and associate professor of anesthesiology at uh, Harvard Medical School. Thanks, Bob. Uh, sure. I was actually going to masquerade as Julie for about 10 minutes. It would be hard to do much better than that, frankly. Um, so uh, this talk is going to be rather different, I think, than the preceding talks and a little bit different than what is to follow. And for the next 10 minutes or so, uh, or until Bob sends Steve George up here to hip check me off the podium, uh, I'm going to be talking mostly about individual differences and in neurobiological mechanisms in the care of patients with complex and high impact chronic pain. I don't have any disclosures uh, other than my research support. Uh, and I'll note at the beginning that I'm going to be talking largely about about one small corner of the biopsychosocial model of pain, which I suspect all of you are familiar with and which all of you subscribe to, and which posits that pain is a complex experience shaped by biological and psychological and social and cultural and, env and environmental forces. And broadly speaking, we can uh, divide a lot of those individual difference factors into risk or vulnerability factors and resilience or protective factors. Um, and you've already seen some of the data on this slide, but there are several recent studies of high impact chronic pain in the US, which I think is more prevalent than a lot of people assumed. And there are a whole bunch of clearly delineated risk factors for developing and maintaining high impact chronic pain. So there you can see some of the demographic and comorbid medical and psychosocial risk factors uh, that are becoming well established for high impact chronic pain. Uh, and I'm going to focus now on pain related catastrophizing, which is one of the most uh, uh, consistently observed psychosocial risk factors uh, for the onset and maintenance of various chronic pain conditions. Uh, catastrophizing is a negative cognitive and emotional response to pain. It's measured by patient self-report. You can see some of the items up there. It involves rumination about pain, magnification of the threat value of pain, and feelings of helplessness when people are in pain. And it's now fairly well established that catastrophizing, high levels of catastrophizing, are are an important risk factor for poor treatment outcomes when you're talking about the pharmacologic treatment of chronic pain. This is just one example, a recent study of the treatment of patients with neuropathic pain. They're treated with medications like amitriptyline, gabapentin, pregabalin. And what you can see from that scatter plot is that the highest catastrophizing patients get the least benefit. They have the least pain reduction, and they're most likely to discontinue treatment. Uh, and we've observed this uh, across a number of studies now. Um, but just as important as its role as a risk factor, catastrophizing is also a process variable that changes with treatment and shapes treatment-related outcomes, even when those treatments aren't explicitly directed at changing catastrophizing. So we see that catastrophizing acts as a process variable in studies of CBT, but also in studies of physical therapy and exercise, in complementary and integrative treatments. And in all of these sorts of studies, the findings suggest that treatment-related changes in catastrophizing are a really important determinant of how much benefit people get from that treatment. In this one Tai Chi study that I just uh, had up there, change in catastrophizing explains about three quarters of the variance of Tai Chi-related improvement in disability. Uh, and so our group's been very interested over the last five to ten years or so, uh, led by uh, Dr. Vitaly Napadao, who's hiding in the audience somewhere, uh, in some of the neural underpinnings and neural mechanisms that might contribute to catastrophizing's effects. And we know from a number of functional neuroimaging studies, including fMRI studies, that chronic pain is associated with alterations in how the central nervous system processes information, and specifically alterations in a number of important brain networks like the salience network, uh, one node of which is the insula, uh, which is involved in processing things like attention to threatening stimuli, or the default mode network, which is involved in self-referential cognition, how people think about themselves. And to be very broad and to vastly oversimplify, what we find in the context of chronic pain is that even though these brain networks are separate and function independently to a large degree in healthy 
healthy individuals. In the context of chronic pain, there is an enmeshment or a blurring of the boundaries between those networks, uh, a maladaptive degree of overlap between these networks. And we and others have been interested in whether these psychosocial risk factors might contribute to the blurring of those brain networks and to some of the maladaptive central changes that we see in patients with chronic pain. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk very briefly about a couple of studies that we've done recently. This is a study in patients with fibromyalgia. Uh, they go into the MRI scanner. This is an fMRI study, and they engage in either cognitions that are related to catastrophizing about their fibromyalgia pain or in affectively neutral cognitions. You can see some of them listed up there. Uh, and then we look at the functional data and compare the activation of brain regions when people are catastrophizing versus when they're thinking neutral thoughts. And what we see is that many elements of the default mode network, the medial prefrontal cortex, the posterior cingulate cortex, these are selectively activated by catastrophizing thoughts. And not only that, uh, I just I love to show scatter plots because it uh, really highlights the individual variability here. The patients who activate those regions most when engaging in these catastrophizing thoughts also report the most severe daily pain uh, and have the greatest self-reported catastrophizing. Uh, and, well, that was interesting. Okay. Uh, when we look a little further at catastrophizing's impact on some of the network connectivity, what we see is that chronic pain, many chronic pain conditions, OA, back pain, neuropathic pain, are characterized by a maladaptively elevated overlap between elements of the salience network and the default mode network. Uh, to put this in more psychological terms, it's almost as though patient self-concept becomes uh, more absorbed or taken over by attention to threat, which seems like a completely natural process when you have to deal with severe and impairing chronic pain every day. And what we see in our fibromyalgia studies is that catastrophizing contributes to that maladaptive network connectivity. And the highest catastrophizing patients are those who have the greatest connection, the greatest maladaptive enmeshment of the salience network and the default mode network. Uh, now, this is a, a panel, of course, on non-pharmacologic treatments for chronic pain. Uh, one of the uh, appealing things about studying catastrophizing is that it's a modifiable risk factor. We have treatments and methods for reducing catastrophizing, and frankly, lots of people uh, learn through self-management processes uh, or other sorts of uh, informal processes to reduce and manage catastrophizing themselves. Uh, but we as psychologists and physical therapists and other providers can also help with that. And what we see is that treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy, and you can see here relative to a disease education control condition, those treatments reduce catastrophizing. And the patients in the CBT group who have the greatest reductions in catastrophizing of, over the course of CBT also have the greatest reductions in maladaptive brain connectivity. Uh, so this, you can think of this uh, brain connectivity as a biomarker for reductions in catastrophizing over the course of this non-pharmacologic treatment. Uh, and the beneficial effect of, of CBT on catastrophizing has now been confirmed in meta-analyses and systematic reviews. You can see some of the data here. Intriguingly, there's some evidence that the effects of CBT are largest in those with the highest baseline catastrophizing scores. So the highest catastrophizing patients benefit most from CBT. We see this in our own fibromyalgia data when we look at patients with low pain catastrophizing scale scores and those with high scores. The improvement that patients get is almost twice as large in the high catastrophizing group, and these are patients treated with CBT. So again, the most beneficial effects of this non-pharmacologic treatment observed in the high catastrophizing group that is most resistant to pharmacologic treatment. And so there's some evidence that high catastrophizing may be a patient psychosocial phenotype that's associated with enhanced benefit from particular interventions and reduced benefit from others. 
These are just some data that a colleague of mine, Kristen Schreiber, who's an anesthesiologist, is publishing now. They're data from a group of women who are getting surgical treatment of uh, breast cancer, so lumpectomy and mastectomy. Uh, these women are classified according to their degree of catastrophizing, uh, and they're also divided according to whether they get regional anesthesia, so paravertebral blocks or not. What you can see is that the high catastrophizing group who doesn't get regional anesthesia, who doesn't have this barrage of nociceptive input blocked during surgery, they have more pain and more opioid use at two weeks postoperatively, but the high catastrophizing group that gets the regional anesthesia looks just like the low <coughs> catastrophizing group. Uh, so we can potentially use this phenotype as a sort of selection factor in personalizing and combining treatments for patients with these complex and high impact chronic pain conditions. Um, and uh, I'm just about out of time, so I'll note uh, to conclude uh, that lots of these psychosocial phenotypes are probably reflective of central nervous system processes, uh, brain phenotypes that contribute to chronic pain. Non-pharmacologic interventions clearly exert some of their benefits by acting on these psychosocial process variables and the underlying neurobiology. And eventually, it's our hope that this sort of personalized medicine, mechanism-based research can help us select the right treatments for particular patients. Thank you very much.